welcome to Cambridge Film Trust's A Film I Love. My name's Jenny, I'm one of the Cambridge Film Festival trustees and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Hel Helen O'Hara from Empire Magazine, if I could say it. Uh, welcome to Cambridge Film Festival, Helen, how are you? Thanks so much, I'm thrilled to be here. Well, thank speaking. you. <laughs> thank you for choosing a brilliant film uh, for a film I love. Before we talk about Hunt for the Wilder People, I want to talk about your new book, um, Women versus Hollywood, The Fall and Rise of Women in Film. I've just finished it and, okay, this is, right, so it felt, as I read it, it felt like I was sort of taking part in a conversation with a really good friend, admittedly a friend who had done loads of research. <laughs> statistics about like how depressing the gender disparity can be in the world of film but tonally I found it fascinating because I felt it could have been uh it could have been full of anger you know just full of anger but instead you managed to set this tone that has clarity and it has warmth and I was wondering is that something that you set out to do I mean, honestly, yes, I, I didn't want to make it uh, sort of angry because because I feel like that allows people to just kind of dismiss it. Oh, you're just being emotional. And again, this is something I talk about in the book, but that gets weaponized against women. And and the thing is, it's it's not just an emotional book. I am obviously angry about some things, but it's more it was more an attempt to kind of understand what are the kind of forces that have led to this situation? Why is it that most directors are men? Why is it that most films are about men's stories? Why are most of the films that win awards and you know get column inches, are they all men's stories as well? Why are most critics men? And I just kind of wanted to you know, unpack some of that and try and understand it myself apart from anything else. Uh, so it's not so much, there is definitely anger. There's stuff I'm, I'm, I'm just furious about, but it's mostly just an, a genuine attempt to kind of understand it really and you did I mean you did, it's so well researched it's such a brilliant read but you did a lot of interviews for the book um were there any interviews any of your interviewees who particularly sort of stood out to you either for how frustrating their story was or because you saw some hope for the future so much hope like so much hope and I think that's what really st stood out for me is that they weren't they didn't have time to be angry. So the, the directors I spoke to, you know, they did occasionally when really prodded, they would admit that some things had been difficult, but you did have to prod them because they're so focused on getting past that and just making the film anyway. And, and you know, that yes, they have to deal with that, but there isn't time to be angry because they, they want to get it done despite that and not let that stop them. And then when I talked to, you know, a lot of activists and things who are, who are trying to change the picture, Again, they're they're focused on solutions, so they're frustrated. They they know this is not fair, but they don't have time to get angry about that because they're putting all that emotion into changing the picture. So I was it was actually very very encouraging as much as anything else. Even when we were sort of you know shaking our fists at the air together when we were when we were able to meet up for interviews, you know, there was a sense of yes, I know it's so annoying, isn't it? Um, but at the same time, they always had a yes, but, and they would kind of go on to, to sort of address something. So it, it, I think there's a lot of really amazing women who are doing a lot to change this and they're taking really practical, positive steps. And I think it will have an effect because they're beginning to work together on a scale that I don't think we've seen before in Hollywood. And I think that's what gives me hope for the future. You'll find that the final chapter feels very hopeful and it mm. you talk about the change that we can collectively do to change the picture. Uh, you refer to something that you'd mentioned earlier on, which were these cat parties um, by, I think Francis Marion arranged, yeah. can you tell us a bit about the cat parties? Cat parties were, so Frances Marion was one of the big screenwriters of the, well, starting in the silent era, but her, her career went into sound as well. And um, she would have these parties, these get togethers for other women working in film in Hollywood. So it would be actresses, but it would also be writers. It would be directors because there were directors at that point, uh, female directors. It would be all of these women getting together you know, talking about the stuff they, they were working on together, maybe collaborating, maybe giving each other encouragement or advice, or I know that guy, you you know, you want to get around him or you want to whatever. Um, so, so it was kind of, it was a very practical sort of 
sociable networking kind of event. And, and I think that's kind of come back with things like Cine Sisters and Film Fatales, who are now trying to do the same thing essentially in the modern era and on a slightly less social and more kind of political uh, foot. I guess you have things like, um, I, I talked about some of them in the book, but Ava DuVernay's new, very new system, Array, and then a Prime Primetime Network, which was set up by uh, Victoria Emsley, she, she's talked about in the book, um, and uh, Alma Harrell's uh, system, which I'm totally forgetting. Um, oh, Free the, Free the Work, isn't it? Free the Work, which is, which is her sort of database of female directors. So all these women are making these databases, they're making these lists, they're, they're putting people's names out there, they're saying, there is no excuse for not hiring a woman in that position because there are women who are capable of doing that and here are their resumes, you know. So again, they're just kind of removing the old excuses and they're, they're sort of putting women forward in a way that men have always put each other forward. Uh, and I think that's, again, a really positive step. Definitely, definitely. You also talk at one point about different tests that can be done to sort of encourage discussion about representation in film. And I'm yeah. sure many people are familiar with Bechdel test or the Bechdel Wallace test. But can you tell us about the sexy lamp test? Because this was a new <laughs> one on me. Yeah, I mean, this is none of these are ones that I've developed, but they're all just ones I sort of tried to get get together. But the the sexy lamp test uh, was basically a question of could this female character in a film be replaced by a sexy lamp without actually affecting the plot? So, in other words, is this woman just there to look good and not really do anything? Um, and there are a lot of films with sexy lamps in them, and then some of those sexy lamps, there's there's a sort of addendum to the test. To the text because some of those sexy lamps do actually at least explain something during the film so a lot of bond girls will at some point go oh yes but the baddies layer is under a volcano when you need a special code to access it which is hidden in a scenic place in new mexico or something um and so that's a sexy lamp with a post-it note stuck on it so that's a sexy <laughs> lamp where all they are all they do is a bit of exposition and then that's it Brilliant. I mean, it's brilliant and depressing, but it's brilliant. Depressing, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just a final question before we get onto the film. During your research, uh, the book and writing the book, like, has, has it changed? Do you think it's shaped the way that you view film? Or, I mean, like unconscious bias or just generally how you approach viewing, viewing a film? It's, it's probably made me more aware of, of how far back in history some things go and, and how how much uh, what we see now has been, you know, shaped over the past 50 or 100 years and not just sort of more recently. Um, so, so things like the way that sh censorship uh, shaped the careers of, of especially African-American, but all people of color uh, in, in the studio era, that was kind of, I didn't realize how much of an effect that had and that kind of came as a, a bit of a revelation to me. Um, but yeah, just just trying to keep aware of some of this stuff myself because you know I, I'm cis and straight, and therefore some of the LGBT stuff I wasn't really aware of to the same degree that I am now. And for example, I, I talked to Glad, the the campaigning group in the US, and one of their spokeswomen sort of explained to me exactly why it's particularly important for trans representation for those roles to be played by trans people. Um, and, and I hadn't really heard it articulated quite as clearly and importantly as that before, but she was basically saying there is already a perception that, that trans people are in some way dressing up as or putting on a persona that is not authentic. And when you have a Eddie Redmayne or a, you know, whoever uh, playing a, a trans person, a trans woman in that case, and then going to award shows in his normal tuxedo because he is a cis man, that kind of reinforces those stereotypes and reinforces those mistaken ideas and and has an you know appreciable bad effect in the real world so that kind of thing i i knew it was not ideal obviously for non-trans people to play trans roles but i hadn't heard it articulated quite as clearly as that and that kind of thing really made me more aware and really made me aware, more aware of the of the shortcomings in my own knowledge so so yeah it has been helpful um just to kind of go through this all at once really and, and spend so much time on the research and on the interviews. Well thank you for spending that time because as I say it's brilliant read so that is Women in Hollywood and so on to your chosen film Hunt the Wilder People so yeah in real in real life in normal time <laughs> what we did with a film I love is we'd invite a guest to the Cambridge Art Picture House they would introduce the film 
then collectively we would all sit in the lovely cinema and watch the film. Um, so with that in mind, I just to start off, I'd love to know if you can share any particular memories about the first time you saw this film. Like, were you in the cinema? Were you in a screening room? Were you on your own? Were you with a bunch of your empire colleagues? Uh, do you have any expectations about the film? Um, yes. Uh, to to the last one anyway I had high expectations because I saw it in Australia I was there for a set visit to Alien Covenant and I had wow. yeah and, which was fabulous like not going to lie it was it was great to, <laughs> to get to fly that far do you remember when we used to travel anyway um so so I was sent to Australia to do the set visit for Alien Covenant and I had heard a lot from Australian and other friends on Twitter uh, and Facebook and the like about this new film, about this new Taika Waititi film. And I, of course, was a huge fan of things like What We Do in the Shadows, so I was already hyped for it. But it wasn't due out in the UK for like six more months. So when I had, uh, I, I added a few days extra to my trip because it seemed obscene to go that far for just a day or two to be on set. So uh, I, I basically made it my business to get to a cinema in Sydney and see Hunt for the Wilder People. So I was, I was not, you know, I was alone at that day. I didn't have any friends with me. I did a meet, meet up with a couple of friends that trip, but it was just one of the great cinema viewings because I, I, I expected good. I didn't expect it to be probably my favorite film of the past 10 years. I mean, I just think it's practically perfect. I love it. Amazing. Well, for those who haven't seen it and are about to watch it um, for the first time, can you give us a brief description of what, what, it, what's it, what, it, what it's about? Yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, so it's, <laughs> uh, it's the story of Ricky Baker, who is a 12, nearly 13 year old foster kid uh, played by Julian Dennison. And Ricky is, he's kind of run through all the foster homes in the city. He's, I think, had some bad experiences in care. And uh, he has been brought to a sort of last chance saloon of a, of a foster uh, family way 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 out in the middle of the sticks and Ricky is a wannabe gangster he considers himself cool he is appalled to be there um, and keeps trying to run away uh, much to the discomfort of his uh, of his adoptive sort of aunt and uncle as they call him and through a series of events that I don't I almost think are a spoiler to talk about too much even though they're quite early in the film um, Ricky ends up lost in the bush with uh, his foster father, Heck, who's played by Sam Neill. And the two of them have to learn to survive together with the whole world looking out for them uh, and unable to find them. So it's, it's hilarious. It's really moving. It's uh, a great story of you know, loss and loneliness and finding an unlikely family in the middle of nowhere. And I just think it's wonderful. How would you describe the relationship between Heck, Hector and, um, and Ricky Baker? Um, I would say it's reluctant on both sides at first. <laughs> Ricky is not necessarily there through Hector's manoeuvrings. It's his wife who wanted, who wants uh, Ricky there. And, and Heck is extremely gruff and it keeps him at a distance and barely speaks for the first sort of 20 minutes probably of the film. Uh, he's a, you know, sort of mountain man, but they gradually, find some kind of common ground and and I think that it's that relationship 100% that drives the film because Ricky is one of the greatest characters I think in cinema history I genuinely would I genuinely would rate him with Citizen Kane I just think he's incredible um but he's he's a, a heart he's a little lost boy who's just desperate for for someone to take care of him and and I think ultimately Heck is the same on some level and I so I think they're 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 kind of coming together is is just a really lovely lovely story and it's kind of universal in, in you know application and he yeah Julian Dennison is he's a very natural screen presence I have yeah. seen so Taika Waititi directed uh, an anti-drug campaign advert in New Zealand and and Julian Dennison played one of the kids in it and then I think uh, from what I've read that Taika when didn't even need to kind of audition him it was just like you are at this role it's, the, it's you yeah and uh, and yeah, and if anyone has the time to seek out that advert, it's a really adorable advert. And apparently, it kind of did big things in New Zealand. Um, it really, yeah, it's not the typical "don't do drugs" advert that you think it would be. Um, but going on to Taika Waititi, so where does this film kind of sit within his 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 other films, and what is his kind of signature style that seeps through them all? Do you think? I think I think his signature style is a is a refusal to take things seriously while 
simultaneously often being quite sincere. So he's got this really odd contradiction there at the heart of his filmmaking, which is, you know, he's given us, not just in this, but in something like what we do in the shadows, there are moments of real sincere human or okay, technically vampire connection in that film. You know, there's, there's a, there is a weird love story between a vampire and an elderly lady and it's, but it's, it's played really nicely. And, and similarly in this, you know, it's a weird love story between these, you know, these two lost souls. So I think he comes at everything with a slightly off kilter attitude, but it somehow ends up telling stories that anybody can relate to. And I just, I think he's great. I mean, you know, obviously this came right before Thor Ragnarok. This was, I think, key in getting him Thor Ragnarok. And, and the, the reason for that, I think, is that he has a really good visual eye. I mean, this this film was made on probably the, the crisp budget for Thor, but at the same time, it you know, it it kind of looks fantastic for what it is. I mean, they had a they had a day where there was an unexpected snowstorm, and they got one of the most spectacular shots in the film out of that. This kind of spinning, rotating three sixty degree shot in the in the forest, kind of portraying the passing of time. And it just happened that one morning there was snow, and they were able to do that. You know, I but he but it's being able to to seize those moments of serendipity that I think puts a really great director over the top, and I just think he's great. Yeah. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, um, one more question about this film for the people who are watching this, who might be about to watch Hunt for the World of People for the very first time. Is there a particular scene or a particular character or just anything that you think people should look, keep an eye out for? Oh God, I mean, there's so many. Um, uh, the discussion about the word majestical has stuck with me. Um, uh, I, I have trained myself out of calling things scucks because it confuses too many people who haven't seen this. Um, I love, I love. There's a bit where he he, he meets uh, what he calls ninjas and direwolves, which I think is fantastic. Um, and and everything. Rachel House is in this now. She's also a supporting character in Thor. Uh, she's cropped up in a lot of Hollywood films since this because she is so phenomenal here. And and just every time she's on screen, is 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 hilarious. My favorite, fa single favorite moment in the film, though, comes at the very beginning, where Ricky is dropped off at this house in the middle of nowhere, and he's taken out of the police car by this social worker and the, and the cop, and he, he walks off towards the house, and he just walks around it and walks straight back and just gets in the car and shuts the door, <laughs> and I just think it's it's just an incredibly good moment, so... Yeah, that's that's one of my favorite bits. I just think it's I just I don't think there's a bum note in the film. I, I have no objectivity on this. I just love it. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And the Ricky Baker birthday song as well. Listen. Oh God, yeah. Well, apparently that came about because they couldn't afford happy birthday. So they had to write something on set on the day with the oh, clock brilliant. ticking. To, Amazing. Uh, to oh, no, that's that's perfect. That is perfect. Well, look, thank you so much for choosing this film. It's a well, amazing choice, and I'm sure that everyone is going to absolutely love it if they haven't seen it before or if they're watching it for the zillionth time. So, Helen O'Hara, thank you so much for picking a film you love for Cambridge Film Festival. Hope you love it too.